Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel, and this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series, and I'm very happy to have Paul Rimmer with us today. Hey, Paul. Hello. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to talk about your, your very lovely article, which we'll get to in a little bit. And it is October 29th, 2021, as we record this. And uh, Paul, where, where are you located at? So I am at the University of Cambridge uh, in Cambridge, England. Um, so it's, it's, it's probably sometime in the morning for you. Uh, and it's, uh, it's sometime later in the afternoon slash evening for me right now. Uh -huh. sort of uh, end, uh, end of the day. Uh, it's the beginning of my day. <laughs> uh, beginning of my fall day. Uh, so yeah. the, the, uh, the weather has turned the corner in Phoenix, Arizona. So we're definitely sort of in our fall mode. Uh, okay. So we'll, we'll get slightly cool in the morning, but it still warms up pretty good in the afternoon. Uh, All right. So yeah, it's, a, it's been pretty, pretty pleasant and cool here and the leaves are falling and it's a nice sort of preparation for for Halloween coming up. So. Ah, yes, Halloween. Uh, hopefully I get more kids than I did last year. Last year, I basically got zero for the obvious reasons. Uh, put yes. a bowl out in the bowl. I, nothing was ever touched in the bowl. Um, mm. So this year, I'm a little hopeful we'll get a little bit more. So I, I did my usual um, bag packing and we'll see what we get this year. Yeah, no, it's uh, uh, in the UK in general and where where I've been before, there's not really much trick or treating. Um, Halloween isn't a big thing, but where I am now as an international community, there's a fair number of American families. And so it does feel a little bit like, uh, um, mm -hmm. like back in the States. So hopefully this year, last year, um, as, as with you, there just wasn't much going on. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Cool. That's a, um, is that your home office, Spine? You got a little bit of an awesome bookshelf there. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks. Um, so this is my office at Trinity College. Uh, <laughs> uh, the University of Cambridge has this confusing college system that you can <laughs> look into. Uh, this, is, this is a shared office with a coworker who does various medieval studies and uh, uh, Jewish studies. So most of those books cool. are his. I do have a handful of books around there. Um, a uh, uh, nice Carl Sagan book at the end, Demon Haunted World. And, oh, yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. Cool. So speaking of Demon Haunted World, not to put us in, <laughs> uh, Paul, what do you like to do for research? <laughs> <laughs> so the the focus of my research is usually not so much on, on, on strictly Demon Haunted Worlds, <laughs> but on the origins of our sort of world and life on our sort of world. Uh, I'm very, very interested in prebiotic chemistry and the chemistry that leads to life and the sort of context where that chemistry happens. Cool. Uh, I'm very interested in how the early Earth was, but also how early Mars was, how early Venus was, and how early exoplanets might have been. Yeah. Uh, ways of relating those. I, the really nice thing about exoplanets is even though you have a very low resolution view of them, you can see them when they are young. Mm -hmm. um, at least in principle and very, very soon in practice, we'll be able to see their atmospheres. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the coming hot topic is characterizing those atmospheres. Very cool. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, <laughs> oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, and I do experimental work and modeling work. Uh, I set up particular environments and try to recreate stellar spectra to see how this particular chemistry plays out both in the atmospheres and uh, in solutions on surfaces. And that was actually how I got involved in looking at modern day Venus, believe it or not. So uh, um, yeah. Very Some cool. You may, oh, you got may, two out of three oh, if you're doing both the experiments and the modeling. That's That's pretty good. Yes. I yeah, speak. exactly. I, the one thing I don't do is the observations. I was, uh, the observations are absolutely amazing, and they they are the key for really understanding what's going on, but they are not the thing that I do. Mm -hmm. Two out of three, I suspect maybe <laughs> today you'll pick up the third one there, and you'll be a real <laughs> triple threat. Um, very it cool. has happened with some of my students, but not with me yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And that is going to bring us to this very lovely PSJ article. Hydroxide salts in the clouds of Venus, the effect on the sulfur cycle and cloud droplet pH. And Paul, take us away. Sure. 
So first, I'm going to mention that this was a collaborative work uh, between myself and a uh, 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 genuine geologist, uh, Oliver Schwartel, um, and uh, some of our students that we co-advised, Sean Jordan and Teresa Constantino, yep. and also involved work from uh, uh, Peter Wojtka, Richard Hobbs, and Alicia, um, uh, and Alicia will have to forgive me, I cannot pronounce her last name properly, so I will not try, I've tried many times before, so, um, but, uh, but know, both Peter and Alicia are, uh, um, are at University of St. Andrews, uh, and work in the astronomy department there. Cool. And, yeah, if we could just move to the first figure, this will give a bit of a context both into how I or why I started looking at Venus in the first place and a little bit of the chemistry that, uh, that we think goes on there. So the first thing that I'm going to bring up is this uh, pH three with the question mark on the side, uh, that's phosphine. And some of you may have heard a little bit about the phosphine on Venus. Uh, indeed, I, indeed. <laughs> this, this was my introduction to modern Venus. Uh, I was giving a talk about prebiotic chemistry, uh, a typical talk that I would give um, at Imperial College London. And one of the members of the audience wanted to talk about biosignatures and specifically phosphine on Venus. And I had no idea why until he came up to me afterward and said, we think we found it. And uh, I thought that that was interesting enough. And Venus was something I wanted to model anyway, because sulfur chemistry is incredibly important. Um, for prebiotic chemistry, for understanding early Earth, for understanding the formation context of exoplanets. And the natural place to start with any sort of atmospheric chemistry is what we know best. And so Earth and Venus are where we really know our, sul our sulfur chemistry best. And so this was something I was planning on modeling anyway. I thought this is a wonderful context, a, a possible biosignature um, to, to sort of set out modeling this. And initially, I was just interested in contextualizing pH three, getting some sulfur into my chemistry, and then moving back to 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 sort of prebiotic chemistry. This sort of paper, I don't think, was really part of the vision until I found out that Venus's chemistry is incredibly fascinating, and so little is known about it. It's just intrinsically interesting. So we're just going to set phosphine to one side right now. If you want to ask some questions about it later, we can go into it, but. What I still, what I really started to get interested in was S, SO2, this sulfur dioxide. So mm -hmm. I'm going to start there. Um, actually, I'll start with CO2. CO2 is what the majority of the atmosphere is made out of. The majority of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. It's about 97% carbon dioxide. The second most abundant molecule is not included on this plot. That's uh, molecular nitrogen. And there's about as much molecular nitrogen, roughly, in Venus's atmosphere as there is in Earth's atmosphere. But because there's so much more CO2, <laughs> right. um, it only makes 3%, but it is about, you know, a bar, roughly. Okay. Um, and then the next most abundant thing is the sulfur dioxide. And sulfur dioxide, you would expect to be relatively stable until you get into the fairly upper atmosphere, um, at least at the concentrations that it's at, which is about 150 parts per million. That's 150 molecules of SO2 for every molecule. Um, in that particular region. And, and that's, that's around what it's known to be at the surface. A very strange thing happens though. It goes through and above the clouds as it diffuses upward. Um, it breaks up above the clouds, but uh, while it's breaking up, it, it drops off by several orders of magnitude. Um, it, it disappears into the clouds. And the standard explanation for this is that the SO2, um, dissociates to form um, oxygen. The CO2, which I mentioned, also dissociates to form oxygen. This is photo dissociation. A photon comes in, knocks into the molecule, and breaks it apart. And H2O floats up as well. So, um, and uh, uh, what, what happens is the SO2 will run into those free oxygens from the dissociation to form SO3. And very quickly, that SO3 will combine with the H2O to form sulfuric acid. And this is kind of the standard explanation for where the SO2 goes and also where the H2O goes, because both of them get depleted. There's some good evidence that something like sulfuric acid is what the clouds are made out of because of where the clouds are located in the atmosphere. And I guess at this point in time, we could actually just look very quickly at figure 
two. There's some other stuff that's happening on figure one, but we don't need to discuss it right now. Sure. Um, if we go to figure two, this will help us to identify why sulfuric acid is, uh, is relevant. And it's, um, it's the temperature side of figure two that is important. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at this, this is temperature in Kelvins and height in kilometers. And you do see that there's a region that's relatively cold um, around 60 kilometers. Uh, um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it goes below 300 Kelvins above that. And so if there were water clouds, which people had speculated early on with Venus, this is where you would expect them to be. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not where we find the clouds. In fact, that's relatively close to the cloud tops. There are some hazes above that. Um, but most of the clouds are between about 48 kilometers and 60 kilometers. Okay. And when you look at the sort of temperature, when you start to get to close to 48 kilometers, you're starting to talk about 400 kelvins, and that's not where you would expect there to be a lot of condensed water. Um, people, people thought that it might be um, condensed uh, uh, hydrogen chloride, uh, hydrochloric acid, but the optical properties of the clouds are not consistent with that. The optical properties of the clouds are still pretty mysterious. There's a mysterious ultraviolet absorber, but uh, the optical properties closer to the infrared are very consistent with something like sulfuric acid, either sulfuric acid mixed with some water, maybe some other components there as well, but largely sulfuric acid. And so this also was consistent with what you saw with the SO2 disappearing. Yep, cool, it, I'm with you. <laughs> Oh, oh, great. Okay. Um, but there came to be a, a bit of a mystery that I stumbled on not knowing anything when I was modeling this. I couldn't get the depletion to work out. I was playing all sorts of games, um, changing the way in which the atmosphere moves up and down. If we look at the other side of figure two, mm -hmm. um, this is one of the sorts of games that I was playing. Um, and I found out other groups, uh, Beerson and Zhang, have a wonderful full atmosphere model of Venus and they play a similar game to what I was playing here, although I didn't know it at the time, changing what's called the eddy diffusion coefficient. This is a centimeter squared per second. And this is basically just a way of parameterizing chemical mixing. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Injection model, right? And my thought is if I slow this down enough, it'll give enough time for the reactions to happen so that the clouds can be made okay. and it didn't work. And then I started really digging into well, what really is going on? And I found out that there was a real problem. And it turns out this is a problem that the Venus community knew very well, but because I was new, I didn't know it as well, which is that near the surface, there's about 30 parts per million H2O, 30 parts per million water vapor. There's about 150 parts per million SO2. At most, you're gonna be removing two SO2s for every H2O when you form this sulfuric acid. One to get you that free oxygen and the other to make the sulfuric acid. Mm -hmm. And so uh, 150 divided by two is 75, not 30. So there's not enough water to do all of the work. Yeah. And so there had to be some other chemistry that was happening or the observations were just wrong about what's near the surface. A lot of these observations came from these descent probes. They're not always consistent with each other. They weren't really... The first ones especially weren't really designed for such harsh environments. And even the ones that are sort of designed for these harsh environments aren't really because uh, Venus is very, very hellish, especially near the surface, uh, temperatures above 700 Kelvins. Um, and you do have to travel through this very, very acidic sort of atmosphere. And so it's very, very hard to make things that can take reliable measurements through that kind of environment. Um, and so the measurements are a bit scattered all over the place. Um, and really in this paper, we explore that and we explore a hypothesis of um, if there's some way to hide the hydrogen, to kind of hide water so okay. that you could get it into the clouds to do this chemistry uh, okay. without it appearing as vapor in the atmosphere. This would be one way to do it. And uh, one of the first ways that I thought about it is as these hydroxide salts. And hydroxide salts are things like sodium hydroxide, so NaOH, or calcium hydroxide, CaOH. And the things that I was excited about this was that OH. If you mix that into sulfuric acid, it will dissociate very quickly. That OH becomes free, and then that can make some more water, and that water can then react with the SO2 that goes into the solution to make more sulfurous and sulfuric acid. 
And so, and interestingly, some, some, some predicted minerals, some sulfates and some sulfites. Um, and what we can do now is we'll skip a few uh, 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 figures and we'll move down to, I think it's figure seven. Let's go to figure seven. We'll try for figure seven. Yeah, it's all good. Give me one sec, figure eight, figure seven. Looks like we got. Yeah. Ratios is function of height. <laughs> okay. So these are the Ooh. molecules that have some observational data, either from ground-based observations or from probes or from, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, from satellites that we've sent around, around Venus. Um, uh, and as you can see, there's the SO2 and you can see it going away. These mm. are mixing ratios. So it's the fraction of SO2 compared to the whole rest of the gas mm. in terms of numbers of molecules. Um, and this again is a function of height. And um, if you look at the black line, that's the line that you get if you don't do anything special. If you just put the model together, have it run um, with what people think the mixing should be mm -hmm. and what the surface condition should be and everything else. And as you can see, no depletion. You can look at H2O, similar problem, no depletion. Right. Um, and uh, uh, some of the other molecules fit pretty well with that and some do not. Um, uh, HCl, of course, does very well because it's not especially chemically active. It is important, though, for some of the uh, molecular oxygen chemistry in the uh, in the other in the upper atmosphere, um, uh, which we can go into if there is interest. But focusing a bit on the SO2, um, if you include this hydroxide salt chemistry, you get the dashed yellow line, and the mm -hmm. dashed yellow line more or less fits the depletion pretty well. And so, yeah, we. We should probably really zoom into that SO2, mm -hmm. and you can see that 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 matches reasonably well uh -huh. with the data. Um, and uh, the H2O also ends up being depleted fairly well, um, and that matches. You will notice that there are these spikes that go up in the clouds that are not matched very well by this data. There is some argument as to whether those are believable as global descriptions of. Venus, or whether those are very, very local to where the probes are, because that's all probe data, or whether the probes were actually running into the sulfuric acid droplets, which by number of molecules is still around 50% H2O. And so they, they might have seen a big spike in H2O around the, the places where they see the spike in the sulfuric acid. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would make sense if that's the case, but that's still yet to be explored. Um, lots mm -hmm. of things are not well understood about, uh, about Venus's atmosphere. The, the last molecule that I think we should look at is molecular oxygen, which is to the top and right next to, uh, yeah. And as you can see, both with the standard model, um, although it's not quite as bad, um, and with um, another model that we can talk about, a water-rich model, this is just adding extra water to make it so that it's about the same amount as the SO2 so you can get the chemistry to work. In both of these cases, you get a lot more O2 in the upper atmosphere than what is observed. And this is one of the classic problems um, yeah. with modeling Venus's atmospheres. You get too much O2. As mm -hmm. you can see, we still don't do all that bad, even with just the standard model. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that we don't do as bad as, as, as a lot of other models, and I'm just gonna highlight this real quick uh, because I, I do think that this is really good work. Sukrit Ranjan led up this great paper looking at the water vapor cross sections and how water vapor photochemistry works and found out that it has a huge effect on what can happen with, um, with atmospheric evolution on early earth. Well, I applied his newly measured better cross sections and they really also helped with the O2 problem in Venus's upper atmosphere, but they don't fix it all. It does get even closer if you use these hydroxide salts. And the main reason is a lot of the O2 that's left over comes from the dissociation of S of of SO2, of the sulfur dioxide. If you remove the sulfur dioxide, there's less to dissociate. Cool, very good. Yeah. So the next place that we could probably go is looking a little bit into the droplet chemistry, or if you have any questions, I'm very, very happy to uh, to go where, wherever you like. Well, I was just curious there because- um, <clears throat> Oh, sure, ask. Uh, ask other, other, other fields. Uh, you know, the, the measurement of cross sections is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm, I'm curious as to just generally how well known 
are the cross sections or the reaction rates since that's <laughs> into uh, in into some of this this chemistry. Is, are they yeah. to be within ten percent? Are they a factor of two, factor of ten? Yeah. So it really depends on the reactions. The reactions that are least well known tend to be the termolecular reactions. Mm. And they tend to be certain photo dissociation reactions, especially with the more uh, reactive species, um, largely because it's it's difficult to disentangle what's really happening with the photochemistry versus what's happening with the kinetics. Oftentimes, okay. when people do this in the lab mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, with particular light sources, they need to include an entire network in yes. order to pick apart what's happening in the lab so that they can try to tease out what the cross section really is. Uh -huh. um, and so, uh, and sulfur chemistry itself is just incredibly difficult and also somewhat underfunded. Uh, I think that'd be wonderful if there was more funding into, uh, um, <laughs> into sulfur chemistry. Uh, there's a wonderful group at Leeds that works at this. And, and there is a great group uh, at, uh, um, uh, uh, nearby University of Arizona that actually works on uh -huh. this. So uh, 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 the, the yeah. Lions group. So yeah, yeah. 20 miles uh, to the south of me. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, okay, Thanks. because of that, the sulfur chemistry is even more uncertain than the rest of the chemistry. Um, and then probably the most uncertain um, would be the droplet chemistry because we don't really know what's in the droplets. I just kind of made up some hydroxide salts to just fit with the SO2. Um, the next step would be seeing if this chemistry could really happen in the lab. Um, and that's something I'm interested in doing later. And then also, um, uh, uh, whether the, the chemical composition of the droplets that you get is consistent with the way the clouds look. And that's something that I hope other people will, will do later mm -hmm. is to find out what the clouds are, are in fact, really, really made of. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Um, so looking at the most uncertain part of the paper next, if we go back up uh, closer to the top, I'm not exactly sure where. Um, I think it's in either the second or the third section, but we'll start seeing a whole bunch of uh, chemical reactions. Ah, there, if you go back down. Okay, I'll figure through. Yeah, we got a little, a little bit of little farther than I thought, I think, no, or that's no. not the one that I was. If you go down a little further, it's not a figure, it's equations. Oh, okay. Um, or in I was just going to point out the chemistry that I included. If you keep going down, got an SO2. Oh, that's what I saw. Sorry, we need to go up again. So oh. this is, uh, um, that's the oh, effective rate here. that I put into the code to get the code to converge a little bit better. These here are the are. ones that, here yes, are. here we are. Yep. This is what I'm assuming is happening with the chemistry. So if we look at this, um, we have the sort of uh, standard chemistry at the top for sulfuric acid. So sulfuric mm -hmm. acid, when you put it into any sort of solution, water or anything else. Oh, please. No, no, I I'm, I'm just made a connection. Keep going. Oh, yes. OK, so yes. Sulfuric acid will immediately dissociate into this, uh, this bisulfate, which is that HSO4 minus mm -hmm. and proton H plus. And that happens so quickly in most solutions um, until it reaches a sort of equilibrium around a pH of minus three. Uh, that's where the pKa of minus 2.8 kind of kicks in. pH becomes a little bit meaningless below zero. So I, I won't go into the details of that. There are different ways to quantify that though. But if you still stick with pH, that's, that's around where it is, which just means that when you put it into almost any solution, it just breaks apart and you just get a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of protons. And in fact, um, if you're in a more neutral solution, so something a little closer to pH of two, it will break apart again. So the bisulfite will break apart into sulfate and, um, and another proton. Um, mm -hmm. So if what can happen though, if I add my hydroxide salts, which is actually equation 25, mm -hmm. okay. you'll notice that, that that has a pKb and that's because it works the opposite way. In very acidic environments, it breaks apart. So, so, so certainly if I throw this into sulfuric acid, all this NaOH will break into Na, Na plus and OH minus. Yep. And then what happens in equation 24 is the OH minus meets with that H plus and makes H2O. Sure. Yep. And that H2O can then remove more SO2 by equation 21. That H2O will react with SO2 to form H2SO3. It turns out H2SO3 is very unstable in almost every situation anybody's looked at. In fact, no one's isolated it in the lab ever. 
Wow. Okay. Um, it's called sulfurous acid. Uh, there are some speculations that might be on Mars, but it wouldn't be stable probably in Venus's atmosphere. It would immediately dissociate to HSO3 minus or bisulfite and H plus or a proton there. But you notice this pKa is different. It won't dissociate as easily. And so mm. um, one good consequence of this is that the SO2 gets removed and a lot of it does. And then there's another consequence, which is that the pH goes up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we can see how the pH goes up. Um, and I think that's figure five. Yeah, and basically uh, making the water in situ as opposed to relying on it. Yep, that's the trick. <laughs> yep. Yep, I'm with you. Okay, figure five. Awesome. Yep. Figure. All right. <clears throat> Cloud yep. key function of height. And the one thing that I'm going to concentrate on here um, uh, is the black line, which is the pH. Okay. And uh, this gets to a sort of pH of around 1.5, roughly. Mm -hmm. This is a bit arbitrary. I can throw in a little bit extra and get more depletion. I can move the, um, the, uh, the sodium hydroxide around. Again, this is just a parameterized form of sodium hydroxide that I added to get the depletion that I wanted to. The next questions would be, where does this come from, which we'll touch on, and, and how would it really be distributed? Or is sodium hydroxide even plausible? Is there some other chemistry that might be going on? Okay. Um, but at least at this stage, what this suggests is that a lot of the chemistry that would be happening in the droplets, if, the, if you wanted that to remove the SO2, mm -hmm. it would also have the effect of somewhat moderating the pH. Yep. Um, there is one really important thing to emphasize here. Uh, I don't want to be too much of, uh, of a downer about this uh, because the idea of life in the clouds is very, very magical. But um, even though this does make the pH better for life, um, it actually makes the water activity at least as bad, if not worse. It ends up removing even more available water because what happens is all of this goes into pulling out the yeah. SO2. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so you end up making sulfites and things. And so the water activity is incredibly low. And there was a recent paper, I don't remember the name of the first author, it was a very, very good nature astronomy paper that uh, talked about uh, um, uh, the water activity on uh, Venus and other uninhabitable planets or some provocative title. Mm -hmm. um, the water activity is the biggest problem for life as we know it in Venus's atmosphere. And this, if anything, might make the problem a little bit worse. There might be some ways around it. And there are some astrobiology groups that are taking my work and applying it in that direction. Yep. But uh, um, uh, at least if you take the work as is, um, it, it does make the, uh, the droplets a little less caustic, but it still makes them as arid, if not more arid. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. Nice figure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think now we, we could probably talk about what chemistry might really be happening and okay. where it comes from. And for that, there's not really a figure, but there's a sort of list near the end of the paper. And we can go through the list. I all need to look at the list anyway to kind of remind myself of all the options so I don't leave anything out. Mm. Yeah. So if you go back up a little bit, um, we got to possible sources. I, I saw that somewhere. I thought I did. You probably did, and we got a little bit of... Oh, yeah, oh, we there go. we are, here possible here. sources. If we go up a little bit higher. Yep, yep, right about number one, NaOH. <laughs> um, oh, actually, a little further up, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, there, exogenous delivery. Ah, okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah, this is section 7.1, exogenous delivery. Could it be okay. that whatever it, it is that's removing this comes from space. That's yeah. one of the natural places where you could look for this. Um, and what I did was I took a very, very favorable sort of assumption about what could be carried from, from various material. In fact, this, this assumption is, is based on calculations um, that Sukrit Ranjan again did uh, as part of uh, our collaborative work on the phosphine stuff because right. some people speculated that phosphine could have come from space. We use the same sort of calculations. It turns out that there's no way to get enough material to make enough water to remove the right. SO2. And in fact, even if there was, it's reactive enough above the clouds that you probably just create water vapor and then you'd see a lot of water and you don't. Um, 
and in fact, one of the things which is done here is we get a sort of estimate for um, uh, how much of this we get. Like, uh, I think that, that that's where you get that uh, 10 to the minus 13 yeah. moles per centimeter squared per second. Mm -hmm. And if you keep going down, mm -hmm. um, that gets compared with, uh, oh, sorry, that's my fault. Um, if you estimate how much you need, you need about 10 to the minus 13 moles per centimeter per, uh, squared per second. Uh -huh. And then if we use the estimate, which I cite Greaves et al. 2020 and also Aaron Brink 1996, you get yep. 10 to the minus 17 moles mm -hmm. per centimeter squared per second. Mm -hmm. So uh, a few orders of magnitude off. Dust from the surface um, is quite mm -hmm. promising, actually. Uh, that could in principle work. But then the question is, what is the dust made of? And that's where we get our numbers one through six. And uh, that's where we look at the NaOH. Could NaOH come from dust on the surface? Mm, okay. and, and the answer is almost certainly not. Um, and the main reason is it's just not stable equilibrium wise near ah. the surface. And its kinetics wouldn't allow it really to be there. Calcium hydroxide, however, um, would be more stable. Um, it's not thermochemically stable, but it has a longer lifetime. And so if you can get it to a high enough height before it degrades, then the barrier will be so large that it will survive effectively over the lifetime of, of, of Venus, at least until it gets into the clouds and starts to react. And so calcium hydroxide is a possibility. Uh, neither magnesium or iron hydroxide works very well. There might be some more um, exotic hydroxides like aluminum hydroxides that might be able to do it, uh, but we weren't able to find enough information to constrain what the thermochemistry would be expected there. Most of what we got from at least the actual thermochemistry is that none of these hydroxides should be especially stable at above 700 degrees uh, Kelvin. Okay. Yeah. Um, the oxides, uh, there may be a way to remove this without introducing hydrogen. You might just be able to react directly with um, uh, SO2 or SO3. Um, and make sulfites and sulfates. Um, and I think that, uh, uh, and number six is in fact, that idea of making sulfates more directly. I think that there's a lot of work that can be done with this. It really hasn't been explored much because we just don't have the, um, uh, the laboratory data. Most of the laboratory data comes from earth serosols, which also tend to be fairly high in sulfuric acid and sulfates if you get um, cold enough and high enough up. So uh, we do also have some pretty extreme aerosols. And so some of this has been done, but even then the water activity on earth is way too high. Um, we need to start doing experiments in more Venus analog sorts of environments to see how this chemistry might work out. Yeah, yeah. And sure. so those, oh, and then um, if you scroll down further, there's one more possibility, um, which Oliver Shortle uh, and, um, uh, uh, Peter Voitko really explored, and, I'm, uh, and that's volcanic delivery, which you can yeah. see right there. That's a variant of the dust delivery. But the nice part is there, you might really be able to have some, ma some magmatic chemistry that's supported because of just the weird um, magmatic content, maybe. Hmm. And if that and that chemistry could even support the sodium hydroxide again. So we could be back to that. Uh -huh. And if you have explosive volcanism, um, you might be able to throw that material up fast enough so that it quenches before breaking apart. And so sodium hydroxide could come back into the picture conceivably with volcanic delivery. The problem here though, is that the volcanism would have to be fairly water rich already and would have to be fairly active. And if you had active water rich volcanism, you probably wouldn't have such a dry Venus in the first place. So right. again, there might be some clever way to reconcile this. Um, uh, but it doesn't work particularly well. And then there's one more that actually involves the exogenous delivery, um, but we don't need to scroll up for it. I was just gonna mention it very, very quickly because I liked the idea. Mm. You might've had a recent larger impact that broke up in the atmosphere and dropped a whole bunch of reducing uh, material into the clouds. Uh, okay. That could explain in principle, although people actually need to do the experiments and calculations to see if this really could, but it could in principle explain the SO2 depletion. It could explain some of the reduced materials seen by some of the probes and potentially also provide an explanation for the phosphine if the phosphine is there in Venus's atmosphere. Uh, Baines et al. mentions this as a possibility, although calculates the sort of odds of that having happened fairly recently and said, it's pretty unlikely, but unlikely doesn't mean impossible. 
if that had happened, then what that means is, first of all, this, this is a sort of transient thing that Venus is doing, which would be really exciting. Correct. Correct. And yeah. the other cool thing is you would start to make all sorts of predictions about weird metallic phases that you would find in the droplets. <laughs> Mm. get a hold of them. So there would be some wonderful predictions that you could make um, that would distinguish that hypothesis from all of the others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, that actually pretty much concludes the paper. We've talked about what the possible sources are, how little we know, um, and uh, what it is that we're trying to explain. Very nice. Very nice. Paul, thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely PSJ article. Uh, it was it was my absolute ple pleasure, Frank. So you touched a little bit on it uh, at various points in the paper, uh, uh, the article. Um, and so I just want to follow up a little bit on it, on where do we go from here? You mentioned the possibility of, of uh, doing laboratory uh, uh, astrophysics, laboratory planetary science of, of uh, you know, trying to simulate more of a Venus atmosphere. Um, uh, there's also probably more measurements to make on the cross sections, the reaction rates of these things. Are there also maybe additional data coming from, does anybody have plans to drop another probe in 2020s, uh, into, <laughs> for example, and just kind of, you know, where, where do we go from here, let's say over the next five years on really characterizing uh, Venus's atmosphere? Yeah, so I think that there's the question of what I'm, planning on doing and what the community can do in the short term and what the community can do in the longer term. And uh, um, I'll start with what I'm planning uh, on doing, which is I'm planning on going into the lab and doing some experiments. And I'm not the only one who would like to do this. I will highlight also Sarah Horst is an incredible laboratory um, experimentalist, and she wants to measure some of the optical constants relevant for Venus's atmosphere. And it would be wonderful if she could end up doing that someday. Um, cool. uh, uh, I think that there are a lot of groups that would like to work more on this. And, and I think that, that this is a very promising time. I think that this is exactly the right time because there are three missions and maybe even more than three that will be going to Venus in the relatively near future. And those missions are Da Vinci Plus, mm -hmm. Veritas, oh. uh, both of those are NASA missions, and then Envision, which is an ESA mission, or maybe it's an ESA NASA mission. I'm not, I'm not positive. Um, Veritas and Envision will not be in situ missions. They'll be going into orbit around Venus and they'll be looking um, at its surface. And um, in the case of Envision, some about its atmosphere and atmospheric chemistry. Okay. It'll be looking in these spectroscopic windows that get you a little closer to the surface. Da Vinci Plus, however, will be traveling into the atmosphere cool. and into the clouds and even below the clouds a bit to get an idea of what the chemistry is like below the clouds, because that's the best idea of getting out what the sulfur cycle is like. You wanna have a very good idea of what the chemistry is like right when the clouds are breaking apart. Mm -hmm. Just like if you wanted to know what was in the clouds on earth, you take a cup, you'd gather some of the water, you'd evaporate it, you'd see what was left. Yeah. Venus just does that naturally. And so if you got a probe there, you could get a really nice picture. <laughs> there are a couple other potential missions that are coming up that are worth highlighting. One is a breakthrough mission concept, which uh, is being led by, uh, by Janusz Pataski and Sarah Seeger at MIT oh, yeah. and has rocket lab support. And that would be to specifically go into the clouds to look for biosignatures. Okay. And then uh, there's some discussion of uh, another Russian mission, um, uh, 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 Venera D. And there's an interesting conference coming up about that. Um, but all these wonderful missions are great. We're going to see a whole bunch of stuff, but if we don't have a good laboratory and modeling context for it, it'll just be more confusion. And so right now is the perfect time to do the experiments, to do the models, to come up with these hypotheses and to genuinely test them with these upcoming observations. Awesome. We're going to have a very, uh, very interesting future coming up. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, and I look forward to seeing some of your future articles on this topic, Paul. Absolutely. Yeah, no, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to continuing my work with Venus. It's, it's, it's become a very, very interesting planet for me. Cool. And that'll do everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Paul. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.